Nebraska farmers weather the storms, hail, tornadoes, and of course the economy. 2014 was a year of ups and downs for Nebraska agriculture. On this year-end edition of Grow, we're taking a look back at some of the top stories, plus some of our favorite moments, the farm families we've met along the way, and some outtakes from the show. Stay with us. Rocked by weather and the markets. 2014 was a year of ups and downs for Nebraska agriculture. Here's a look back at the top stories of 2014. We rode out the whole thing in the storm, so we knew immediately it wasn't good. Mike Wilkins was laying irrigation pipe when the hail hit. A lot of guys a lot older than I am and have never seen anything this widespread this, this late in the year. Summer storms battered Nebraska cropland. We gotta move. And from Sutton to Pilger, tornadoes damaged rural areas across the state. The pieces of this roof are completely wrapped around the tree. Disasters like this bring Nebraskans out, out to help their friends and neighbors. Those storms had some positives. 12 months ago, 86% of Nebraska was abnormally dry and some still in extreme drought. Conditions that started in 2012 finally ended in the summer of 2014 and that wet weather delayed harvest and even canceled one day of Husker harvest days. The parking lots were just going to be way too muddy. On policy issues, 2014 started with the farm bill finally becoming law, which now seems like old news after two plus years of delay. Groups like Farm Bureau and the cattlemen quickly focused on the EPA, especially concerned about clean water rules local government is much more appropriate to regulate irrigation ditches than the EPA. The EPA is out of touch. With former Ag Secretary Mike Johans retiring from the U.S. Senate, Farm Bureau put its support behind Ben Sass, who defeated Dave Domina, an attorney who's worked on many egg issues. And as Pete Ricketts prepares to be sworn in as governor, he too has made agriculture a main focus. Agriculture is the heart and soul of what we do here in Nebraska. Cattle producers enjoyed record prices, but grain farmers suffered as prices fell to about half what they were just two years ago. Not many uh, private businesses could take a 48 to 50 percent reduction in the price of their product, and, and that's what we're looking at. 2015 could be a challenging year for Nebraska agriculture. Cattle prices may come down some, but it will take time to rebuild herds devastated by that drought. And farmers prepare to plant corn and beans just hoping they'll break even. And we'd like to hear from you. We invite you to join us on our Facebook page. Look for NTV's Grow and give us feedback on what you think were the top stories in agriculture in 2014. And here's a story that may fly under the radar, a record setting year for agriculture in the classroom. There are more FFA chapters and members than ever before. Area schools like Adams Central added programs this school year, but it's a challenge to find ag teachers. Those who consider it are being courted by agribusiness that offer better pay. Agriculture is very, very good in Nebraska right now. And so industry is in high competition for very qualified individuals. And sometimes they'll take some of our better teaching candidates into industry. The thing about it is teaching agriculture and being an FFA advisor is unlike any other career or profession. You get to see students grow over the course of four years, not only in the classroom, but also through leadership and FFA. Those teachers are mentors to those students and make a difference every day. NTV's Grow was humbled to receive multiple awards from Nebraska FFA this year for our efforts to highlight youth in agriculture. But also we received honors from the Nebraska Corn Board. Of course, our greatest reward comes from knowing we're providing important coverage of the issues important to agriculture. We love highlighting farm families like the McFeeders of Gothenburg. And if you've ever enjoyed a bag of Doritos, chances are you've enjoyed their corn. NTV's Lauren Scharf has this Farm Family of the Month. Not just any farmer can do what the McFeeders do. They have to grow according to Frito-Lay guidelines, taking extra care and every corn stalk grown. When I was young, I couldn't get out and wait to get out in the spring, get on a tractor. Burton McFeeder started with a few hundred acres, but now his family has grown. <laughs> and so has his land. You, know, you see the fruits of your labor every single day, and 
every year is different. There's different challenges. There's growing technology all the time. It's changing so fast we can hardly keep up. It's very gratifying when um, the people, the, the children that you work with want to come do the same thing you've been doing. Uh, it must look like fun. Scott McFeeder's kids will be fifth generation farmers. Or we'll just let the well run and... It isn't just any corn they grow. They've put the corn in corn chips ever since a Frito-Lay facility was built nearby in 1995. All of the corn that goes to make all of the chips west of the Mississippi comes from the collection point here in Gothenburg. All the corn behind me will be destined for chips. Primarily they're interested in having a ratable supply throughout the year and so we contract some for every month from um, basically October through the following July. Frito-Lay uses more yellow corn in Fritos, more white corn in Tostitos, and Doritos have a mix. Nacho cheese are probably my favorite. We contract for a certain number of bushels at a certain basis compared to the Board of Trade, and then when the Board of Trade goes up or down, then we can price it according to that, that basis. Although the chips themselves are made elsewhere, it all starts with more than 100 farmers near Gothenburg. A lot of people don't know where their corn goes. It just goes to the elevator and... Well, not sure. It just gets distributed. So we know where ours is, and it's cool. I did ask if they get any free chips out of the deal, but they don't. However, the McFeeders can try out the newest kinds of chips before they're out on the shelves in grocery stores. In addition to those farm families, we also love highlighting technology on the farm. My co-host Marilyn Barnett had some opportunities this year at Husker Harvest Days to get an eye in the sky. Here's more. You have on display here at Husker Harvest Days different drones, and this is kind of the wave of the future, don't you think? Oh, I sure do. It's uh, We like to call them unmanned aircraft. Okay. But explain the purpose, the specific purpose of this one, for instance. This one, uh, this airplane, it's a fixed-wing airplane. It flies about 40 mile an hour, has about an hour and a half flight duration. Uh, we use this for surveilling crops. What they do is they deliver essentially real-time information from this view that we can't get any other way. Well, can you believe it? We came up these steps really easily, and here we are on top of a bin at Husker Harvest Days. Alan Mitchell joining us from the Ag Division of Chief there. And But this is actually the top of the building, and we're comfortable. We're not holding on to things, worried about sliding off. It's really important to, to kind of have something like this, don't you think? It is. It's, it's really important that farmers be able to get up on top of their bins, check their inventory, make sure everything's working the way they want, and they need to do it safely. And one thing with Chief, too, you listen to farmers, you get ideas from farmers as well all the time, right? Some of the best ideas we get are from the people that actually use the equipment and we're, we're crazy if we're not listening. It's really important for us to make sure that we're paying attention to what the market wants and providing solutions. Also, you can go to our website, Nebraska.tv. One of the major pushes this year was to expand livestock operations in Nebraska. That was the focus of a major University of Nebraska report that came out this year and a focus of a feature we called Steakonomics. Looked west, and uh, we found a lot of opportunity in Nebraska. Training the hills of Virginia for the wide open countryside of Nebraska, Steve Wolf was drawn to a state whose potential for livestock may be unparalleled. Nebraska has a lot of advantages over a lot of other states, and water is clearly the number one advantage. And uh, you know, any kind of livestock industry, there's a lot of opportunity in Nebraska. Many enjoy meat, eggs, and cheese, but what smells like money to some stinks to others. You can't send your kids outside to play. You can't have your windows open at night. We were here first. It's definitely nothing to put next to a town. That was the reaction some had seven years ago for a cattle proposal near Ravenna. Unfortunately, they you know hear the bad stuff, and you know there's a lot of good stuff out there, and that's what uh, you know the livestock industry has not particularly done a great job in the past on educating you know, the public on, on what we're doing. And livestock producers can invest in high-tech systems to protect the air and water and have all the permits, but if they don't convince their neighbors, that planning could be for nothing. It's not just the regulatory requirements and the environmental protections that go with that decision, it's the policy uncertainty of how much can I invest in planning such an activity when I don't know for certain the, uh, the, the process involved. That uncertainty is built into the law. In Nebraska, we operate under local control and zoning control in the state. Some producers who may want to expand don't. 
not wanting to fight that battle. Be denied by a county board or something, uh, it, it gets discouraging and it makes it so that other individuals don't want to go and invest that effort. In Iowa, there's no local zoning of agriculture. Decisions are made at the state level. Nebraska values local input, but there are so-called livestock-friendly counties. It's not an honorary title, but a way to designate counties that are open to expansion, removing some fear of the unknown. We don't have any rules on the books that explicitly state that this process uh, leads to certain approval. Steve Wolf says livestock-friendly counties are a great start, but he wants to build on that, working with counties and the state to attract more farmers like this, where it makes sense. We still have the same opportunity here in Nebraska. We just kind of need to get on board. And, uh, you know, a lot of it starts with educating, educating the public and uh, our consumers, or, you know, what we're doing and, and just educating them about uh, large livestock confinements. Coming up after the break, does anyone appreciate the value of hard work quite like Nebraska farm families do? We will meet a family raising their adopted kids on the farm Plus, later in the show, some bloopers and outtakes. You're watching and TVs grow.